Hi there, it's Darren Moffat, your host. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Nerds of Business podcast. As you might already know, our mission is to make entrepreneurs happier by solving the key challenges that all businesses must overcome. We'll get to our guests and the problem-solving bit in a minute, but I want to start today with a fun game. I'm about to play you some text that's been placed in a wildly different context from that of its original source. Your challenge, should you accept it, is to identify who actually said the words you're about to hear. We're respected again. We're no longer the laughing stock that gets taken advantage by every country, including by the way, our allies, who in many cases take a bigger advantage than our enemies. I will tell you that. They take big advantage, but not so much anymore. We're winning. We're winning like never before. Washington Democrats keep on losing their minds. They hate the fact that we're winning. We're winning big. We're winning, winning, winning. Did you guess? Yes, it was the 45th President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. That speech grab was taken from a rally he did on the 20th of February 2020 in Phoenix, Arizona. Now have a think about what just happened here. I took a short excerpt of a speech you've almost certainly never heard before. I put it through a female robot voice simulator and then I set it to a lullaby. And you probably still recognized it. That's the power of brand positioning. Donald Trump's political brand is so distinct that for good or ill, it's instantly recognizable. Now, before you might get the wrong idea, we're not about to discuss politics or ideology here. But when I began putting this episode together, I was looking for a brand with global recognition that I could use to illustrate the concept of brand positioning. Try as I might, I simply could not find a better example. You might recall that to the media and a lot of his political opponents, it seemed completely crazy when he won the 2016 Republican nomination. But if you look at it from a branding perspective, it begins to make a lot more sense. Trump's team actually pulled some classic branding moves that large corporations have been using for years. First, they identified an uncontested brand position. Now, I want you to visualize a vertical line crossed with a horizontal line. In your mind's eye, you should see four quadrants. Top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Most politicians, just like most retail products, tend to cluster around the middle where the two lines intersect. They don't take risks, they're pretty safe and even boring. They're trying to please the mass market. Trump's team saw that this left wide open spaces of uncontested brand position in almost every direction away from the center. Next, they boldly staked a claim on a big chunk of that open space. It wasn't long before Trump had a whole quadrant of brand position to himself, a huge advantage in a crowded market of 22 candidates vying for attention. Straight away, he stood out, and it soon became clear at his political rallies that because his brand position was so radically different, the same rules didn't apply to him as they did to other candidates. In much the same way that luxury brands can charge a premium for their goods, Trump could say and do things that were unthinkable for any other politician. It drove his competitors mad, but for Trump supporters, it was all on brand. His words and actions were congruent with his brand positioning, and it took him all the way to the White House. It's an example of brand positioning that literally changed the world. What if more entrepreneurs were able to harness some of this power for the good of their business? And if brand positioning really is so powerful, how can you use it to change your world for the better? I love data. I I love kind of looking through the data. You need to have systems, you need to have structure. You're going to get chopped to pieces. Enthusiasm is unstoppable. We kind of hit a point where we were like, we need another lever. 
Drown yourself with people who are smarter than you and richer than you. <laughs> this is Nerds of Business. So the title of today's episode and the problem we're trying to solve is how to use brand positioning to carve out market share and annoy the hell out of your competitors. We've got some great entrepreneur guests today, including the CEO of a publicly listed company that's reached a valuation of $1 billion. We'll get to his story soon. But before we get started, here's just a quick reminder that if you're enjoying Nerds of Business, to please hit the subscribe button on your podcast player. This way you can get future episodes delivered to your device automatically every fortnight. It makes it easier for us to stay in touch. So you may have got a basic understanding of how brand positioning works from the Donald Trump example at the top of the episode, but there's a lot more to it. I spoke to Rachel Bevins from The Healthy Brand Company. She's one of our two branding experts for this series on branding. Uh, from a technical perspective, it has those four key components, those key elements, which is the consumer insight and problem. It will have the value proposition and the benefit to the consumer, and it will have those key proofs. So people will then take that, I mean, we'll often develop that into a model, so it will have the other elements around it. So we'll have it will also have your purpose and your vision and your values, yep. and it will also have, at the bottom, it will actually have your um, tone of voice, your personality, behaviour and those key identity elements. So that brand model, and it's it'll it'll all be summed up as a brand idea. So that brand idea is probably the, cl- the clearest short form that people can use to then go and uh, bring things to life. So yep. across everything that they do, whether that's product or promotion or um, people or the, the environments in which it exists. Mm-hmm. Um, so you use that to springboard those, all of your, um, your, your four your four to seven P's. Mm-hmm. Hang um, on. That's nerdy. Your four to seven P's. Coming. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> I was so trying do, not to say it. Do, do really, <laughs> I, I can do it again, but uh, people, you probably get sick of it. Um, do you want to explain the the four to seven P's? Yeah, this is yeah. The, we're, going, we're nerding out on brand strategy here. Yeah. Yeah, so the four P's are essentially your market strategy. So it's looking at your product, your promotion, your place, and price price thank you very much <laughs> i have read the textbook yeah and the reason why it's expanded to seven p's is it really takes uh, into consideration more of the uh, the um service brands so okay. you have people and process as part of that and physical um, evidence as part, of that, as part of that so why is this so important for business owners what benefits or advantages can you obtain for your business with a superior brand positioning you live and die in your positioning. That's why, you know, the positioning as part of the brand is so critical. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you aim to be premium, example, as a product in your brand positioning, as opposed to, you know, um, budget, right? But then you're presenting everything budget. Good luck with that. It's yep. not going to work. Yep. Um, so your positioning, uh, you know, is all about elevating you, okay, uh, and you must get that right. So the positioning is everything. Uh, and the interesting thing is, you know, in reference to positioning, you got to – when you're working with professionals in this space, and you would know this, you've got to work with people that know their stuff. That's John Michael from The Image Group. He's the second of our branding experts, and you'll be hearing a lot more from him throughout the series. <laughs> I'm a big believer in the power of mission statements, vision statements, and brand values to sharpen your brand position. When you know exactly what you stand for, it's easier to stand out from your competitors. And this was a key theme in the conversation with my next guest. Dr. Rob Newman is the CEO of publicly listed company Nearmap. Nearmap are a global leader in mapping technology, and they've reached a market capitalization of $1 billion on the Australian Stock Exchange. Let's hear what Rob's got to say on this. So let me start with the mission, because I always like to start there. Um, we change the way people view the world so they can profoundly change the way they work. And, um, you know, so that mission, I think, is timeless, because what it says is if we can help our customers, business customers, 
um, change the way they see the world, then um, we can fundamentally change the way they work. So how do we do that today? Um, what we do is we have technology that allows us to capture um, cities, around 600 cities globally, um, and these camera systems fly in planes. And uh, most people will kind of have an, a comparison, which is satellite view. Um, what we are, if you want to think of it, is satellite view on steroids, uh, much more frequently updated, much higher quality, and that allows businesses to replace a physical site visit with a virtual site visit using the map. Um, and, you know, that's a very high value to our customers. So, again, by changing the way our customers view the world, um, they profoundly change the way they work. They have much more a much higher quality information, much more up to date, and it saves them time and money. I love that straight away. The, the mission is so clear. Uh, I don't think it's any coincidence that often the most successful businesses have super clarity around who they are, what they do, um, how they do it, and so on. So I was really surprised to find how crowded this market is, um, You know, because I think the perception of the public is that Oh, online maps is Google Maps, you know, and of course, you, you know, you can imagine that there'd be some others, mm. but there are a lot of competitors in this space. So what's your brand position and, and how did you arrive at that? It, it is, you're right. It's a highly competitive market and highly fragmented, lots and lots of small players. Now, let's put Google aside. Google does mapping for two reasons. One is to sell you more ads or provide you more ads. And the other one is to drive their autonomous vehicle market, Right. That's not what the space we're in. We're in the space of serving business customers, B2B. Um, And yes, there's lots of small companies out there. The big difference uh, is really that we provide a subscription service. Um, So everybody else that's out there uh, will fly a plane, capture some imagery and deliver a disc three to six months later to their customer. It's very much that old enterprise bespoke kind of model. Uh, We've flipped that completely on that on its head And our model is more analogous to Netflix. We generate the content ourselves and then deliver that through the cloud as a subscription service. So if you're a business, you don't have to wait for somebody to go fly that survey or go find that data. It's already there. It's already in the cloud. Um, That's a very powerful proposition to business customers because literally they call us up and sign a subscription and immediately have access to all of North America or all of Australia's content. How did you arrive at that? Because that's a very, very interesting story. I mean, you, you made the comparison to Netflix. Mm. Um, the clouds changed everything. You know, faster internet speeds have made all this possible. Yeah, mm. Maybe give us a bit more detail on that process. How did you come to this model? Yeah, you know, and, and look, this is a great lesson for all um, early stage companies, I guess, which is I always say you need to have the persistence to keep pushing forward for your vision but also the wisdom to know when to give up on that and move to some, pivot to something else, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's a, it's a weird schizophrenia for a uh, startup CEO, that's for sure. Uh, look, for us, it was one where we were very much a technology-led company. Um, our founder, Stuart Nixon, had uh, understood that if, we, if he designed a new camera system and processing software and designed those together, he could fundamentally change or profoundly change how efficiently we collected content from the sky. And um, so that was really the starting point. But what we actually found is even though it was intended as a virtual place to meet for consumers, most of our users, and we were giving it away for free, most of our users were actually businesses. And, you know, this is an important message is listen to your customers and understand how where they're seeing the value. And as we started to see the usage really go up significantly in Australia, we saw actually, you know, that usage is coming from businesses just continuing to come to our service every day. And uh, that was really the, the, the pivot point. So we started as a digital company. We started as a, as, a, as a subscription service. We started in the cloud. So we've always been there. But the key was to understand what value did we deliver? And once we saw that that was for business, then that really pivoted the company and we became a subscription service focused B2B. And when did that happen? What year did you bring that model in? Yeah, so look, I mean, and this, by the way, just gives you an indication of, you know, how long it sometimes takes to work at your business model. Um, the original technical work done by Stuart Nixon was in 2007. Our first kind of commercial service that was put up was in 2009. And the actual transition to a B2B business model was 2012. Right? Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Right. 
you know, and so it was, it was not, um, you know, it was one of those ones where we kept trying different models and how would this work and, and uh, looked at advertising models, looked at all of these different structures. And, um, you know, eventually when you listen to your customer, the answer is kind of blindingly obvious. Rob's also got some great insights to share on how brand positioning, or at least the execution of the strategy, must sometimes differ for different markets. And to the point around the American expansion, the penetration into that market, I think you, you have about 1% to 2% penetration, is that right, into the American market Correct. at the moment? Mm-hmm. Uh, and highly fragmented. So what are the specific things that you've done to stand out from your competitors in that market? Yeah. So it's interesting, you know, we have one to two percent of the North American opportunity. Um, In many respects, actually, um, we're probably one of the top two or three providers in North America. So that tells you how fragmented that market is. Right. So, you know, the, the, the kind of excitement of North America, and I know some companies focus on China as well, but let's pick on North America. Um, you know, it's a large market. It's an exciting market. It's the market where if you win, you can win. If you win there, you can win anywhere. You know, those kinds of uh, uh, themes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the challenge, and we made this mistake as well, was we went over there and said, we've got the model working in Australia. We're just going to go replicate it in North America. Wrong. Um. <laughs> you cannot replicate what – Australia has uh, some natural advantages, right? It's a smaller country, mm-hmm. so therefore it's easier to get the marketing message out there. Um, and whether we like it or not, North America is a more sophisticated market than our, than our own. Not more intelligent. It's just because it's a larger market, there's much more complexity. So even though you're going after a very large market, what you actually have to do, and it's kind of, again, a bit counter-intuitive normal logic for, for a CEO is to say, actually, I'm going after this huge market, but actually what I need to do is focus, focus, focus. Who is the one customer who I can win with and um, and be the world's best at for that one customer? Once I've got them, I'll get two, then I'll get four, then I'll get eight, then eventually I'm going to have market domination. So you have a big vision but a real focus. I often use the uh, phrase, and it kind of surprises people, that um, when they're going particularly in B2B marketing but maybe even works with B2C, uh, I ask entrepreneurs, tell me the colour of the eyes of your first customer. Oh. <laughs> Mm. Right. And it's because unless you've actually gone and visited your first customer uh, or visited those first customers, you don't understand their business. You don't understand their pain points. You don't understand how their buying decision works. Whilst Rob was super clear on what his brand stands for, sometimes it's just as important or effective to define your brand positioning by what you don't stand for. Fred Shabesta is the co-founder of finder.com.au. They're a $250 million internet business that has become a leader in comparison. And the way Fred tells it, articulating what Finder won't do and won't say was a key step in setting their brand apart from competitors. So another thing I've banned um, in our brand is you can't say the word, find the right credit card. Find the right one for you. And the reason for that, and this is actually one of our competitors' actual taglines. You banned that. You, so you, that language doesn't appear anywhere on the site. You're not allowed to use that. Wow. Because what it's saying is you're wrong. Mm-hmm. Or find us, you know, or another one is, another one I, I, I banned is smarter. Mm-hmm. Here's a smarter way to do things. What, are you telling me I'm stupid? Yeah. Another thing I refuse to do is make fun of the customer. It's not a joke. This is not joking matters. This is people's lives. And so we never use buffoons or, um, you know, clowns and jesters. They're they're a great tool. They work. You know, other companies do that, but that's not something we stand for. We honor the customer and they're making serious decisions. We empathize with their life. Just because you're in that debt doesn't mean you can't do anything. And we're okay about that. Come to find a – let's go and figure out a way what we're going to do. Let's go and take some action. So it's very much – a, a value or, a, or a, a, it's about empowerment mm-hmm. more yes. than y- using an archetype to run down and, you know, run down a negative and make a point. It's about empowering the consumer. Yeah. And, and I think the word you used before, I think is very important. I think that empowerment. So the fourth value of fun, there are five values of fun. The fourth one is empower people. So that's where I think that that comes from. And it's constantly coming out. Um, you know, we believe in teaching people to fish, not to fish. I think I just wanted to add one more um, 
element. The business model that we're in is one of people making decisions and, and empowering themselves. And that's it's an, it's an ethereal concept. Like it's not a – I can't point at it. I can't hold it in my hand. Yep. And so the other thing I refuse and we banned is metaphors. The reason we ban metaphors is because it means that as a customer – you're, t- you're, you're making me have to go and think more about your ads and, 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 and why? Why, 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 why do that? And instead what I encourage us to do is just, just tell it. Yeah. So the second value of finder is being straight up. Just be straight about it. Mm-hmm. You know, don't be, it's okay to be, you know, we're, we're here to help you compare. Yeah, there's credit cards here and mortgages and then they're probably not the most fun things to do, but hey, there's shopping and stuff. It, just tell it straight. Yeah. And then- the customers that want to use that and uh, find value in that, they will. And the ones that won't, they'll go, okay, that's fine. But at least you just told me straight. Don't let me sit there and think about some relationship to a gorilla or some, like, uh, just like, and, and where that came from, I was in the UK and I was sitting, um, it was about January 2007. No, it was about 2014. I was sitting in London and the TV was on. And I was looking at the TV. I don't really watch TV. As I said, I don't have a television. And I, I looked at the TV and this ad came on and it just said, um, Storm Insurance. If you want Storm Insurance, go to storminsurance.co.uk. We've got your Storm Insurance right here. Done. The ad was over. And I was like, wow, that is really helpful. You know, if I'm concerned about storm insurance, you just told me what it is. And you mentioned it three times, four and, times. It, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm like, got it. I know what that is. I know what you're selling. Thank you. In if I'm interested in the market, if I'm in the mode of get, trying to get that job done, I can go and rent your service to get that job done. Thank you for being so polite with my time and just telling me straight. Mm. And I said, I said, it was, I was like, that's a really beautiful ad. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I was, I was very grateful for you it. You were grateful. Wow. I think that's such a great insight um, in terms of you're not using metaphors because that's a friction point. And one of my pet theories, I've got a lot of them, um, but but I think irony is a waste in advertising. Um, and, you know, it's really hard to pull irony off well because it's all about context. And particularly in a, in a society these days that's way more fragmented, it's not a monoculture society, um, irony doesn't translate very well. So whenever I see irony or metaphors – in marketing or advertising, I kind of quietly shake my head and go, that's a lost opportunity. Um, so it's, it's, it's actually, thank you for sharing that with us. That's, that's a really great insight. I agree with you. I think, I think, I think your insights are probably better than mine, but I, I agree. <laughs> You're too generous. Um, so you can define your brand positioning by what you stand for and also by what you're against. But sometimes you can be fortunate or smart enough to be early in a new category. If your brand can be among the first to scale in an emerging market, you can possibly end up owning the category. Now, this is kind of like the holy grail for brand marketers, and it's pretty much what my next guest has achieved. Pick Pico is the founder of Pick's Peanut Butter. They're an international food brand that now export to 13 countries from their base in Nelson, New Zealand, and they've got an annual turnover of more than $30 million. Pick, who is actually legally blind, has been running his business for over 10 years after becoming frustrated with large food conglomerates adding sugar and all kinds of other yucky stuff into their peanut butter. So he decided to take things into his own hands and make some himself, and he started in the local markets and has gone all the way to global supermarkets. It's really a a fascinating story, Uh, and he's now the category leader in what I would call real or authentic peanut butter. Let's hear from Pick. There's a lot of people making homemade jams and stuff, but I would imagine there weren't as many people making homemade peanut butter. Like, is, did you stand out more just simply because it was a little harder to do and there weren't as many competitors in that environment? Uh, I guess so. I hadn't really looked around it to who was making peanut butter. I mean, you could buy, you could get, you could, they had grinders and some uh, supermarkets and stuff. You could put peanuts in and grind mm-hmm. them up and sort of make, what appeared to be fresh peanut butter, but it was ground up peanuts, no matter how old they were or whatever. Yeah. But um, no, well, there was nobody. There was nobody doing it at the time uh, in New Zealand, and 
and it was a while before I came across any other natural peanut butters. Uh, it was only when we started exporting and, and, and I realised how good ours, how well ours stacked up against any others in the world. Yeah, and I had a look in the American market actually for a bit of research and that category yeah. is really growing. There's quite a few competitors out there now. Yeah, there's a lot of natural peanut butters over there now. Yeah. And I think there had been, you know, there had been, but it wasn't until I started tasting them, you know, when I started travelling and trying to sell stuff internationally. And so I started tasting these other natural peanut butters that I realised ours was a hell of a lot better than, than, uh, than, than those other ones. In fact, I, you know, it's the best in the world. I'm, you know, I'm actually confident of that. So it's, it's a pretty cool place to be. It's very cool. And it's, it's a massive achievement. Um, and, you know, I think your journey here is so interesting to get to that point where you can build this business. Uh, I, mm. I know that you started off um, as the son of a grocer. You, you've had a, a leather goods company. You've been a restaurateur, furniture, furniture craftsman, um, lots of other highlights. What key learnings uh, did you take from, you know, some of those big adventures that made – you such an intuitive marketer with picks because I, I really think the way you do your marketing right from the start. I went back and looked at a, a copy of your website on, on the archive from two thousand and ten. Right from the start, the marketing has been excellent. Oh, yeah, so you can still find our our two thousand and ten website on you, somewhere. You can. There's a thing called the Wayback Machine. And, um, oh, cool! Oh, okay. I'll, I'll send you. I'll, I'll send show you the link. marketing department now and show what they should, what they should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, like, it just struck me that you you're such an intuitive marketer. You you're presumably yeah. you wrote wrote the copy on the site originally. It, it's it's mm-hmm. just really so much personality comes out. So, I'm really interested. Like, you must have taken learnings from each of those businesses before picks, and like, what what yeah. what experiences really kind of led you to turn this into a, into a blockbuster? Well, I, I mean, I, the, the thing, in, in the past, the businesses I've had in the past, uh, when I could see and that sort of thing, I did pretty much everything myself. So, you know, I had the, I had the odd person working for me here and there, but I, I was kind of it in those businesses, which also, which was kind of cool. It meant I learned a lot of stuff, but it also choked the business because I couldn't do everything and, uh, and, and hope to, you know, have a business grow, and it's only been since then, with my eyesight, that I've I've had to you know cut back on a hell of a lot of stuff I do, and and I've been forced to delegate, and that's been one of the neatest things about this business. I think that's why this has grown because I've been forced to delegate. And uh-huh. We've got other people in doing stuff that, yeah, uh, and they do, <laughs> they usually do it a lot better than I could. <laughs> but so, but so having those businesses and running them myself. Um, I did learn a lot of the different aspects about about running a business. So, you know, I mean, when I started making peanut butter and started and it started looking as if it was getting popular, people said, "Oh, you know, the uh, sanitarium's going to come along and make you an offer you can't refuse," and, or something. And and you know, uh, and we were just going along there making a bit of peanut butter, and we started getting a bit of feedback. And and somebody said, "Hey, look, you're nudging, you know, you're nudging the the big." sanitarium or craft or eater whoever it was was selling lots of peanut butter at the time why are you the category leaders and why are you selling three times more than what they're, they're selling what do you think because I, th- I, th- I think they let their product get really crappy yeah. i think they just were started concentrating on price you know let's make it all let's get it we can get this done cheaper in china mm-hmm. and uh and and they had started they were following you know international trends where there was sugar and all the peanut butter so they put sugar in it and, yep. and um, when I started there was there, there had been a family company down in Christchurch that had been making peanut butter for the you know the, the home brand making it under contract for a few um, brands in New Zealand and I rang this guy and I said look I'm thinking of making peanut butter he said well good luck to you mate you won't sell any because all the, all those supermarkets are interested in all anyone they're interested in is price you know you have no luck no chance and and we proved them wrong you know at, because I th- I think I mean as a as a lover of peanut butter myself it has always been something you know you vaguely if people say to you what's your favorite food and uh, and you say peanut butter you know well oh, that's kids food no, we're talking about you know, oh, you know, and so when I when we started selling it, I'd go into fancy delis, delis and stuff, mm-hmm. and they said peanut butter. Oh no! 
our customers drizzle olive oil on their toast. You know, yeah. this sort of nonsense, you yeah. know, that, that it was a kid's food, which it sort of – and I think people were reluctant to say they liked it because it's vaguely addictive. You know, it is. Yeah. It's a good protein and fat. And, um, and, and – but it was – Market it was cheap, you know. It was sort of, and it was sort of marketed as kids' food, I think, you know. And I and I thought when I started making it, you know, you go out for a meal, and you get a platter, you know, a ploughman's platter, and you got the, you know, the, the olives and the bits of fancy bits of meat and a bit of hummus and stuff on there. Mm-hmm. I thought when we've got peanut butter appearing on these platters, we'll know we've made it because you know it's been. And I think we have have. You know, re, rebuilt it as as a, a food that people can be proud to eat, and it's so healthy. Right? There's so much wisdom in what Pick just said for all entrepreneurs. But the thing that really struck me was how he had a vision for his peanut butter as a gourmet condiment for platters and delicatessens. Now, I'm not in the food industry, but that really strikes me as an utterly unique brand position for a peanut butter. And in my humble view, it's probably a big reason why Pix has become such a beloved brand around the world. The other aspect that's so striking about Pix peanut butter and indeed all top brands is what's called brand alignment. I'll let Rachel Bevins from the Healthy Brand Company explain how this works and why it's important. Yeah, it's um, brand alignment is essentially making sure everything within your business does align. And that may sound pretty straightforward, but it actually rarely happens. Yep. <laughs> so, and I think it's really important to think about from a, uh, an entrepreneur and startup perspective to in that when they're st- looking at then the scale-up phase in particular. Because what generally happens is that you are one or two, two maybe a, a, you know, a small team of people. You're all pretty much got the same values. You know, that's why you're attracted to each other. You've got the same drive. You know, mm-hmm. that's what you're, you're motivated. This is your purpose. You know, you're actually motivated to develop this product and um, give it to the people because you think there's really great value in it. So you've a very small team and you're all mm-hmm. pretty much on the same page. Yep. Um, but even then, that's, again, why it's really important for you to have a brand positioning at the very at the core because then you can check everything that you do against that. So it sets your criteria. So it's a measurement mechanism. Yeah. And a control mechanism. Yeah, a control. It is a control mechanism. But yeah. it's, it's to say if you stand for being friendly, open and approachable, yeah. then is are our people, you know, we, we need to put on two more service people. Are they being friendly, open and approachable? You know, are it, if we need to go and do some promotions, you know, is yeah. that – or our website, is that friendly, open and approachable? Mm-hmm. And if you have to go and – you go through like 100 pages to go and find something or your shopping experience is um, way, you know, way too many clicks, well, then that's not friendly, open and approachable. Yeah. So it's actually then using that to critique everything that you're doing. Mm-hmm. And to do – in order, so if you do that, then you actually are aligned mm-hmm. as you start growing. What, what happens to a business when their, their brand alignment gets out of whack? Yeah, and I think of it a little bit like you're making – you're making a promise. Your brand is essentially a promise that you're making to customers. Yep. And so if you don't keep your promises to a friend, what yep. happens? They You don't trust you, them, yeah. Yeah, they, you don't trust them, exactly. That's and right. you don't have a friend any longer. Yes. <laughs> you know, they might they go, hang on a minute, you promised this and today I got that, but yesterday I got that, and who knows what I'm gonna get tomorrow, you know? And so um, if you're not aligned and you're not delivering consistent experiences across everything that you do to your customers and to your employees as well and to all of your key stakeholders, so whether that's your suppliers and partners or your shareholders or whoever it is, mm-hmm. if there's not consistency across that, if you don't have alignment, there's not consistency, then people don't know whether to trust you or not. But sometimes even the biggest brands in the world can get this wrong. And according to John Michael from The Image Group, there's a lesson in this for small business too. No, it's like it's you know marketing departments can get it wrong, right? Yeah. You remember Coca Cola was the same when they tried to change the the taste. That's right. Yeah. I mean that's just crazy stuff. These are icons. You don't touch them. Yep. You know you don't touch icons. You know. That's right. There's nothing to improve on. It's an icon. So so you know people stuff up as well. You know I think sometimes in marketing where people get bored. Yeah. So they say, hey, I want to come up with something new. No, you idiot. Don't touch it. It works. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in branding, I think, you know, especially with small businesses, 
bigger companies do this a lot better, of course, because they know, you know, they know how powerful it is. Mm-hmm. Smaller companies, obviously, they haven't got the resources. They might have two, three different people doing different little bits and pieces. Yep. You know, I website here, you know, logo here, yep. um, communications here, if there is communications, and the, and they're not aligned. So the, there's a lot of incongruency. Yes. So the signature is not the same. It's also important for the founder and senior leadership team of any company to live and breathe the brand positioning, which brings us to a regular segment we call Nerd Superpower. Listen to what Fred Shabesta from finder.com.au nominates as his top superpower. I think you'll find it's a highly revealing insight into how brand strategy intersects with company culture and why he's been able to build a business worth $250 million. This brings us to a segment that we have called Nerd Super Power. A lot of production time went into that. Oh, I um, love that. <laughs> that kind of like made me feel like, ooh, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. So you're getting onto this great topic about individual or personal superpowers. What's your superpower? How would you describe that? I have an ability to see the big picture and – look at the overall vision and describe to everyone a North Star of where are we going and and making a a genesis, a synthesis of everything that's going on and combine it all together and look at the chessboard. Sorry, piece of trivia. I used to be a great tennis player, but I also would play championship chess, which is a very unusual thing. A bit bit nerdy potentially. Yes, actually. That's nerdy. That is extremely nerdy. (laughs) Um. Love, love a game of chess. Um, but I think, you know, it, the superpower there, I think, is the simplicity and of the message and the vision of where are we going and reminding people of that. I think that's something which zooming up and looking down and pointing and guiding where are we and where are we going, mm-hmm. I feel I have a good ability to do that. I think that's would be, again, part of my superpower. So it's not only seeing that, but then you need to go and communicate that. And if I do that for an empathetic way and then go and make that fun and engaging. So the problem we set out to solve in this episode was how to use brand positioning to carve out market share and annoy the hell out of your competitors. We've heard from our brand experts, Rachel Bevins at the Healthy Brand Company and John Michael at the Image Group, on the technical process for establishing brand position and why that's so important. And we've also heard some amazing true stories from our entrepreneur guests, Rob Newman at Nearmap, Fred Shabesta at finder.com.au and Pick Pico from Pick's Peanut Butter. I hope the wisdom and insights they've so generously shared today have given you ideas to crack the code for growth in your own business. For me, however, there are a few powerful conclusions we can all draw from this episode. Firstly, you can't have an effective brand position if you don't know what you stand for. It all starts with your mission, your vision, and the values of your company. Secondly, that what you won't do and what you won't say is a great way to sharpen the differences with your competitors and carve out some serious market share. And thirdly, that the brand position needs to be congruent across everything you do. Brand alignment is the key to executing your brand position so that it permeates across all the comms, the staff, the products, the systems, and everything else that forms the DNA of your company. We're coming to the end, but before we go, it's time for our regular segment, Nerd Under Pressure, where a guest has to share one killer hack or tip they recommend for you, our listeners. Let's find out who is our nerd under pressure today. Now, Rob, uh, we come to one of our recurring segments called Nerd Under Pressure. So this is uh, where we put you, you're you're the the mapping nerd, so to speak, uh, for this, for the uh, context of this episode. Um, And, you know, you've obviously got a very, very um, interesting and, and wide background in business and and, um, and and startup world. What's one killer hack you could recommend to entrepreneurs for 
brand positioning. I'm going to give you some thinking time. Your time starts now. Okay. Put your language in the mind. Uh, put your language in the language of the customer. So if you're solving a problem in the insurance industry and the insurance industry is saying, actually, our biggest issue is that um, we can't uh, do um, the uh, insurance claims fast enough, then put your technology and your brand position in their language, right? And in the early days, that's easier because you're just focusing on one type of customer, you've got one type of product, you know, how do you do that? As the company evolves, you've got to evolve that to a more broader brand positioning. Mm-hmm. Our one, of course, as you just heard, is very much around providing certainty for a very broad range of businesses. But in the early days, it's very much put your language in the language of the customer. So the, ha- the hack would be think of who your customers are mm-hmm. and then talk in their language about who you are, um, and so that will help them understand. Fantastic. So thanks for listening to this episode of the Nerds of Business podcast. If you've enjoyed it, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, Google, wherever you're listening to this podcast. That uh, helps us climb up the ranks and uh, makes us more visible to other entrepreneurs and businesses on those podcasting platforms. If you've got a question or some feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can engage with us at webbuzz.com.au forward slash nerds. That's webbuzz.com.au forward slash nerds. I want to thank all of our guests and the team at Webbuzz for helping me put this show together. And a special shout out to rev.com for the Donald Trump transcript at the top of the episode. We'll be back in two weeks with our next episode, which is on... How to launch a brand with no money, get heaps of attention and look like a complete superstar. Until then, I'm your host, Darren Moffat, and I look forward to nerding out with you next time. Bye for now.